All right, perfect. So we are recording this. So for some reason you do have to jump off. We will have this available for folks after the fact um, on our FWP YouTube channel. So I'm gonna go ahead and just jump us right in, um, do some quick introductions. If you've already been with us, you know who we are, but we do have a guest tonight as well. My name is Sarah Smith. I am the Bo Becoming an Outdoors Women Program Coordinator. My office is in Helena, Montana, and um, I've been hunting for, um, my gosh, I guess since I was just a little, a little one in a backpack on my mom's back, technically hunting. Um, but yeah, so super passionate about it and really happy that you're uh, here with us tonight. Uh, Laura, do you want to introduce yourself? Uh, yeah, my name is Laura Hajak and I'm an administrative assistant in the Great Falls office. And I'm also our volunteer coordinator and then I do educational programs for schools. And I have been hunting for quite a few years as well. Yeah. Right. How about you, Jesse? Hi, this is Jesse Gudgel. I work with the Aquatic Invasive Species Bureau in Helena here. Um, I, let's see, I've been hunting. I think I did this before and I stammered and stumbled because I can't do the math that quick. But yeah, I'll say like Sarah, when I was a, I was a wee tyke tromping around the hills, I had no idea what we were doing other than I was just to be quiet. <laughs> yeah, yeah. Awesome. Thanks, Jesse. And then our guest tonight, which is pretty exciting, is Sarah Allen from Onyx Maps. If you do know what that is, um, she's going to even show you even more about it. And if you don't, you're in for a treat. So Sarah, do you want to introduce yourself? Yeah, absolutely. So I'm Sarah. So I've worked with Onyx. So next month will actually be six years with Onyx in customer support. Um, and so I'll be doing a demo to show you basically what I talk about every day. That's great. Thank you so much. I appreciate you being here. Onyx is a very powerful tool um, for us hunters. So I'm excited that she's going to be able to share more with you about that. So um, tonight, uh, our presentation is called The Hunt. So we're going to talk about where to hunt. That's a pretty big question, when, especially when you're starting out, or even if you've been hunting for quite a long time, um, you know, ownerships change, things like that. So where to hunt can be a really um, frustrating sometimes questions. So we're going to hopefully give you some resources that you can use now to try to kind of scout and decide where you're going to hunt. Um, we're going to briefly touch on who to hunt with. We talked about that a little bit in our very first session. We're going to touch on it a little bit again tonight um, with a few addition, additional things to think about. Um, and then really what to expect when you're actually out in the field hunting, because you know, what you might see on TV is not always the reality, uh, especially in Montana. We have very different landscapes than I think a lot of those, those places or those people and, and how they're hunting and where they're hunting. So we want to just get really real with you about what to expect so that when you get out there, um, you know, there still might be some surprises, but hopefully we've covered some of the things that uh, might pop up and you're not completely taken, uh, taken aback. And then we're just going to touch on a couple of safety topics, things that you can do to really keep your safe while you're out in the field hunting. And so um, we'll just jump in with the where to hunt. And this, this topic we could do, I mean, a couple of days probably worth just talking about maps and where to hunt and using a GPS and all these different things. Um, if you look over here on my screen, you can see this is a legend of our FWP hunt planner, um, which we'll briefly talk about, but look at all of the different types of land ownership. And um, just when you, if you go to look at a map for the first time and you're not very familiar with these, it can be a little overwhelming. So we're just gonna touch on a few of the, um, kind of the big ones that you can kind of look for. And again, just giving you an idea of where to start so that you can kind of go off and do more research on your own. So public lands, we're very lucky in Montana that we have a lot of public lands, especially compared to other states. Um, I hear time and time again from people, they're astonished by the amount of public lands that we have in Montana. And these are some of the agencies or things that, um, yeah, agencies and acronyms, I guess, that you would hear. So DNRC, Forest Service, that's that nice green on the maps usually. Um, wildlife management areas are actually managed by Fish, Wildlife, and Parks, uh, so our agency. And um, some of them you can hunt at. There might be restrictions at some, um, just like anywhere else. Uh, Bureau of Land Management, BLM, 
So again, when people start throwing around, oh, DNRC at the BLM with the state trust and um, state trust and DNRC, correct me if I'm wrong, but those, those are the same basically. Um, but yeah, so there's a lot of different agencies that provide kind of public land opportunities for hunting. And block management is kind of a hybrid. So BMA, not to be confused with BLM, um, a block management area is private land that the owners have enrolled in hunting programs through our Fish, Wildlife, and Parks Agency. And so there's, there's a lot of block management opportunity. It all varies depending on the owner, what you can hunt, where you can hunt, how you can hunt, if you have to sign in at a box, if you have to call in ahead of time to make reservations. So if you go to our Fish, Wildlife, and Parks website or email me, if you have questions, I can point you to the section that has all of that information. Usually they publish a whole book full of maps with um, information. And I think Sarah will touch a little bit on how Onyx helps with that um, block management and finding places to hunt with that. But it's a pretty, pretty amazing program with how many, I don't know the number off the top of my head, how many acres are enrolled, but it's pretty substantial. So it's usually a good place, even if you're just bird hunting, um, it's usually a pretty good place to find opportunity. <clears throat> and then obviously private land um, with owner's permission, if you are new to the state or just new to hunting, um, knowing that you cannot trespass on other people's land, uh, even if it's not signed. So even if you don't see a bunch of orange signs that say no hunting, um, that does not mean that you can go on their property. Uh, I think when Quinn, our game warden, was with us a few sessions back, I think trespass is almost there at the top, if not at the top of things that they, they deal with and cite people for. So knowing where you are, whose land you're on, and making sure you're not trespassing and that you are hunting with permission is a pretty big deal um, in this state for sure. Or Jesse, did you guys have anything you wanted to add? Um, yeah, I just want to add a couple things if that's okay. Sure, um, go for it. So with all the public lands, um, they are public lands, but one thing you do want to remember is you do have to have legal public access to them. So like Sarah was just saying, if you're crossing, if you're on private land, you need the you need permission. So you can access all of those public lands as long as you have legal public access. So if a county road butts up to them or crosses them, that's legal access. Or if you have to cross private land, as long as you have that landowner's permission, then you're good to go for that. Um, and then also just with the block management, um, those books that Sarah was referring to are available in mid-August every year. And if it's something you're interested, you can call any of our um, FWP offices and we have mailing lists so that when that book becomes available, we can get you that. But the great thing about that program too is all of the maps and all of the information are online as well. So it's easy to access for everyone. Yeah, and those are totally free resources that we can mail to folks. And they are, as far as I know, I've never seen a section or like area of the state that really doesn't have block management. Um, I think all the way from, you know, the, the western part of the state to the eastern part of the state, there's some kind of somewhere um, that you should be able to access. So. And the thing that I was going to add is just, you know, we've touched on it before, but it's, I think it's a really important thing to reiterate that even if you are hunting on private land with permission or on public land, if you, and we'll probably touch on this more later, but if you shoot an animal and they cross a property line and you don't have permission, you need another set of permissions potentially to retrieve that game. Just because you're hunting in one area, if your game goes onto another area, you may need to get additional permissions. So it's just a really good thing to be conscious of, especially if you're hunting near a near a property line. Yeah, that's a super important one, Jesse. We might come back to that in the when we talk about ethics a little bit. Um, but yeah, just because you shot a deer and it jumped a fence does not give you permission to go collect that animal. And as harsh as that reality is, um, there are times that landowners will say, no, you're not coming across my fence to go get that animal. And we will talk about that if not today in the next session, a little bit about, okay, 
you know, you shot your animal, you're ready to go grab it and field dress it. Oh, it jumped the fence. What do I do? <laughs> so uh, pretty real situation that can happen, um, especially if you're not paying attention to where you are. So again, knowing where you're at, knowing the land ownership is really important. Okay, so the tools, because of course, We'd love to spend a couple days with everyone just talking about these, but um, FWP does have a mapping um, application. It's called the Hunt Planner, so you can go to the Fish, Wildlife, and Parks website and use that. Uh, it, it's, it's a pretty good application. Um, you can uh, turn on different filters, so you can turn on different game for, you know, boundaries for hunting regulations and things like that. Um, so that's something that you can definitely take a look at. Montana Cadastral is a very good resource if you've never um, checked that out. It's kind of fun just to go on there to find your own property. If you own property, you can look yourself up and it just shows ownership on a map so that if you were questioning, you know, what, who owns this property next to the Forest Service, you could go in there and be like, oh, okay, these people own this. Um, so it's just kind of a, a, another tool or resource that you can put in your toolkit to help you kind of scout and find places to hunt. And then Onyx Maps. So I'm going to turn it over to Sarah and let her just go for it with her demo. So let me stop sharing my screen. And uh, Sarah, you take it away. Perfect. So let me start sharing here and then I'll open the chat as well. So yeah, I can so see you guys that. have questions. Yep. Just definitely put them in the Q&A um, and we'll, we'll address them here um, as we go for sure. Yeah, absolutely. So I'm going to start off with the demo for the website. It's just easier to do on the computer and it's definitely got a bigger screen. Um, and so from our initial website, you'll actually just go to the login page. You'll select your account for the hunt map and then you'll log in. Um, and essentially one of the biggest tools that this is for is for whether you're going to be applying for a tag or if you just drew a tag. Uh, moose, sheep, and goat for Montana was out today. So if you drew a tag for that, what you would start out doing, I will just reference, I have too many states on in my work account. Um, so for Montana, um, biggest one, private lands, government lands, make sure you have those on to see your boundaries. Hunting districts um, is another big one. In the layer settings for hunting districts, is gonna be the biggest where you select what species you're hunting for. Um, so let's just say I drew an antelope tag or I'm gonna apply for an antelope tag. And then I'll go back to my main letters or my main layers. Possible access is gonna be any of the DNRC lands or lumber company properties. So Montana is very fortunate. All of the lumber companies allow hunting access. Um, so that's another big one. And then the block management as well. There's a couple other layers that you can turn on for Montana specific, and that's going to be the CWD layer and then also restricted access. So um, in Missoula here where we live, there's tons of hiking trails. And so all the trail systems outside of Missoula are within those restricted access areas. Um, so we can turn that on and then I could go forever into this. So Hunting district portions, um, it's a lot more peculiar for like deer and elk. In certain portions, you can have a special cow tag that you can hunt, et cetera. So I'll just kind of keep it simple and leave that one off today. And then um, as I kind of pan the map, the location button will be in the top right of the screen. So it'll come find me where I am. And then from here, this is where I'm going to start panning for looking for where I'm going to go hunting. So for antelope, I am always hunting north of Great Falls. Um, so my husband is from Brady. So we'll just zoom here. Don't mind all of my thousands of waypoints. And then, um, so in here in Brady, this is District 404. And so I can see the neon green hunting boundary for this district. So as I zoom in, what I'll start to look for is the property highlights. And so, all of these red property highlights at this level are going to be block management. So it's going to be access that you can look into for hunting. And then as I zoom in closer, I'll start to see a little bit of the color code for state property, any kind of BLM or national forest that you have. Um, and then obviously the closer and closer that I zoom in, I'll be able to see these highlights a little bit better. 
and the names will start to load for me. So as I'm looking, say I'm just going off I-15, I'll look for the color codes and other areas that I'll have roads that I can access that state land or the block management. One of the really nice programs that we work with FWP for at Onyx is the block management. And so if I tap on this block management, an information box is gonna pop up and I'll be able to see, it's actually a Pheasants Forever property. And if I scroll down, it'll tell me all about the block management here. Um, it'll tell me type one, all the info that I need to know. It's currently closed for the spring season. And so I can't click on a link. If I can, let me zoom out here. Typically, if there's an open block management, like you see here, the black with the red polka dots, if I click on that, I'll actually be able to have the direct website map that Sarah was talking about before. Um, so I can click on that. It'll actually take me to the FWP PDF for that map. And I'll be able to see the parking locations that you can see here. Can you see that PDF? Did it open properly? Yep. Okay. So you'll be able to see that it'll have like the safety zones included on it. So you can print this or you can go to FWP, print it from their site as well. And it'll give you on the second page, all of the permission requirements that you need, everything that Sarah was talking about for access for those block managements. Um, so this is super helpful. It tells you what kind of animals you can hunt everything. And so I can just close that and go back to my scouting. Um, and one of the bigger ones, especially out here, the nice part is for all of this private property that's out here, I have learned over the years that most hunters will gladly, or landowners will gladly give you permission for antelope. Deer, not so much, but antelope, you can always ask for permission. Um, and so I'll just zoom in on this large chunk of state property here, and then I can click on it and it's gonna tell me state land, there's actually almost 4,000 acres of state land just on this chunk that's right off the road. So I can easily access it from the road. I don't have to worry about access and I can just hunt that property. Um, and so what I can do from here in my toolbar, I can easily just add a waypoint. I can color code it as well as change it to an antelope. As I'm searching for it. It's in the first row of all types. That's what I thought. I just <laughs> can't see it right in front of my face. So I can edit that. I can always change it. So if I click on it, I can edit the waypoint and I can say, monster buck. And I can save that. I can always go back to it later. I can actually click on it again and I can share it. So if I do have a hunting partner or whoever I'm gonna go hunting with, I can actually send that waypoint directly to them so they know where I'm gonna go or know where I'm looking and then they can look into that stuff too. Um, so it's super helpful just kind of access wise to get that kind of data. Um, there's lots of other tools in here that you can use um, just in the lower right corner. So I'm on the satellite base map. There's also a hybrid, which is satellite and topo together. And then there's also just the regular topo base map. So it really depends what you prefer to look at. I know a lot of Onyx customers, they do prefer that topo data just because they're used to that paper map that they've had forever. So it's super helpful to kind of look at the contours, see where the animals possibly could hide or ways that you could find an advantage to that animal once you do locate it to try and get there without it seeing you. Um, lots of features. One of our newest ones is actually the 3D feature. So I'm gonna zoom out here. It is still in beta, so we're working on all the functionality of it. So once it's, once it's out of beta, it'll be available for offline use as well. So this allows me to tilt that mount. And then I can also see the contours this way as well. Granted, north of Great Falls, it's pretty flat, so I should pick a better location to show you this. Um, let's see if I can zoom in on a coolie here. Or the Sweetgrass Hills of Montana are up here in the, the top part of the screen, so we can go up here. That is a cool feature. Yeah, and so like I said, it's still in beta, so we're super excited once this will be out of beta. You'll be able to use it when you're in the field to kind of help you find those coolies to hike through. 
And so a lot of just, especially for as you're scouting, if you don't know the terrain and you're hunting a new area, it's going to be super helpful to kind of help you go, okay, this is super steep compared to everything else. Like I need to plan. It's going to take me a couple hours to hike that mountain before I need to go there. So I need to go there super early. Um, so just lots of little features in there, but especially for the biggest part of knowing where to hunt, um, just knowing this color code here. So we try to match the color code that FWP has on their website as well. So all the colors should match. Uh, block management is gonna be highlighted with the over top of the properties. So that'll be a little bit different overlay. Um, block, or uh, I keep trying to say the initials and not wanting to do that. So Bureau of Land Management is always gonna be yellow. Um, state land is blue, national forest is green. Um, and then any kind, let me come back towards Missoula here. Any kind of DNRC property or lumber company property is going to be highlighted in a completely different color. So we'll just go up the Blackfoot here. So it's gonna kind of have this horizontal diagonal line just because there is some like state trust properties or like DNRC properties that just have different restrictions for access. Um, but it'll always be highlighted in this kind of color code here for that. And then the roads will be highlighted. So these, because these are forest service roads, they're highlighted in extra color. So I can even click on that road. And if I scroll down to the motorized section, it'll actually tell me what vehicles are allowed here, what open dates it has. So this one closes December 31st. And so there's no travel on it after that. Um, so especially for hunting, we try to get all of the dates in there so that you know if you can drive on that or not. Um, lots of other just general features that we could do for that. Um, is there any questions or any other things that you guys want me to show while we're going over this? Where is the legend for yours? So it's actually built in. So if you just okay. tap on a feature on the map, it'll tell you everything. So okay. that's cool. private lands, it's owned by Montana Checkerboard, which is a part of the DNRC. And then as I scroll through, um, it'll give me the coordinates or anything else. And so because there's no antelope in this, in this area where I highlighted it, it's not giving me any of those hunting features. So if I come back over to where there is antelope in Montana, and I zoom in, then it'll give me the property ownership plus the hunting data plus everything else. Um, so private antelope district 440. Um, and then I can go to the hunt unit specific stuff for those regulations, as well as um, if there was block management, I could click on it there. And then we also added, that's not what I wanted. Just kidding. Weather is down here now. So um, with wind and weather, um, it'll also allow you if you're planning the hunt in the next couple of weeks, you can see that weather forecast right from here as well. Um, so those are just features that we'll add in there for more, basically to help you plan as much as you can before the hunt, anticipate for the weather, any kind of storms, pack the right gear, and then all of the access features. And can you just touch on um, cost and the ways you can use that or, you know, app, mobile, you know, that kind of stuff? Absolutely. So for we have the app, which can be used on your phone, tablet, computer all together for one state, it's twenty nine dollars a year. And then for all 50 states, it's one hundred dollars a year. We also have a chip for GPSs that you can use. You can plug it in. It'll load in the GPS. The chip doesn't have any of these interactive features because it's built to just plug and play. So it doesn't have any of the added features of like the, the um, 3D or like any of those kind of mapping features on there. Um, so especially for just like the state of Montana, it'll give you all of these layers, all of these details for $30. Awesome, thank you. Uh, do any of our participants have any questions about this? It's a pretty powerful tool. And you definitely would need to get in here and play around with it to get comfortable. Um, but it's got so much data in one, one place. Um, I just, I think it's, it's a pretty awesome tool. So. Yeah. And we do offer a seven day free trial. So if you go to our website, create an account, you can play around with it for seven days, access all of the layers and everything before you do any deciding of whether you like it or not. Um, and then from there, we have a full support staff 
Monday through Friday and then email support on the weekends too. So we're always there to help you if you have questions that way as well. Great, awesome. Any questions for Sarah about this tool? Okay, if you think of any as we keep moving forward, we can always loop back and talk more about it, but just wanted to give you kind of a preview of, of Onyx because again, it is, it's a pretty powerful tool and with the idea of, you know, trespass being something that a lot of people get themselves into, um, it's just another way to make yourself um, a little more prepared when you go out uh, instead of just wandering around and then getting into trouble. So definitely Absolutely. good resource. Thank you, Sarah. Yeah. So one last thing, because I was showing on the computer, it doesn't show you your location, but when you use it on your phone, it'll actually show you your live location in relation to those property boundaries. So you'll always be able to know and make sure that you're not going to trespass or anything like that as well. Yeah, that's really neat. And I, I think it would become in useful, the sharing application for a hunt, which we've talked about, you know, leaving a hunt plan with someone, letting them know where you're going to be, that you can get pretty specific with a waypoint and share that with yeah. uh, whoever you want to know where you're at. So very cool. Okay, we're going to roll right along here. But again, if you have any questions, Sarah will be with us until the end. So um, let her know. So I'm going to jump back into our PowerPoint. And we're going to kind of switch gears. Um, so yeah, you know, in the next couple of weeks, feel free to start using some of these tools. Reach out to myself um, if you have any questions about uh, the hunt planner that FWP has, uh, Montana Cadastral. I'm, I'm fairly okay at it, but yeah, if you have questions, I'm happy to try to answer them for you, so. Okay, so just briefly, um, who to hunt with. We Again, we talked about this just a little bit in our first session, but I definitely recommend if you're new to hunting, um, try to go with someone with some experience if possible. Uh, if, if you can, if you know somebody, if you have a friend of a friend, um, you know, someone that kind of kind of knows what they're doing just to get you out into the field and um, help you get, get oriented. Um, oh, here's a question for you, Sarah. Um, do all the features of Onyx Maps work if you have no cell service? That's a good question. Yes, they absolutely do. So um, there's actually an offline tab that you can download all of your areas before you even lose cell phone service. And then you can still put your phone into airplane mode and then all of those functions will still load on top of those saved maps. Um, so I personally use it in the field all the time without service and have no problems. Yeah, very good question. There's still a lot of places in Montana without cell phone service. Yeah. I can go 20 <laughs> minutes outside my house and have no service. Yeah, exactly. So yeah, that's a, that's another really powerful um, reason to use it. So, okay. Um, this is kind of where we were touching on this, you know, ethics piece, um, but hunting with someone that shares your ethics with ethics, just being this idea of what you believe is right. And so we have this conversation quite a bit with um, people, kids, adults, anyone in hunter education that, you know, ethics can be different than laws. So if you shoot that deer and it is on the other side of that landowner's fence and maybe, um, maybe even it's, it hasn't died yet, you know, do you, do you trespass um, if you can't reach it to put it out of its misery? Do you trespass because you shot that animal and you think it's, you know, it's right for you to harvest it because otherwise it's going to go to waste with obviously the law is that you cannot trespass. So you get yourself into some of these sticky situations with ethics um, versus laws when you're out in the field and going with somebody who, uh, again, shares those same kind of beliefs um, as you will really make your hunting experience more enjoyable than somebody when you're, you're constantly fighting with them over unethical behavior. And so, again, we're not going to get into a huge um, debate about ethics or anything like that tonight, but I highly encourage you to talk to your hunting partner ahead of time um, talk to them about some of those things. Like, what are we going to do if this happens? What are we going to do if this happens? Um, you know, some people, if that happened, they had a deer jump the fence and they would notch out their hunting tag because they feel like they've taken an animal out of the field and, or not out of the field, but they've taken an animal out of the system, even if they didn't get the meat. Um, by law, you do not have to do that. And, you know, other people 
would go back out and, and hunt. And there's, there's nothing that says you can't do that. Um, it's just everyone's personal ethics and how they view hunting. And so again, with, with talking about that now is, is going to keep you from getting into maybe an argument or um, fighting in the field when you come into situations that are uh, kind of gray, not black and white sometimes. Um, Jesse and Laura, did you guys want to touch on ethics or, or anything while we're well, I think <laughs> one of the big things that I think about when I talk about ethics and, you know, I, I've met people, it's legal to take a thousand yard shot on a deer. Is it ethical? I don't think so. So I don't hunt with people who are going to do that. I think you're, you're likely to miss, which is the best scenario. Uh, worst scenario, you just maim an animal that you never get to and just dies a miserable death and you've just kind of made a terrible experience for someone potentially. So that's one of my big things when I think of bone ethics versus law. Yeah, that's a great example. Um, I think Jesse just read my mind. I'm not sure <laughs> what that's considered. But yeah, um, I, I agree with her. You know, there are some people that are long range shooters and they go out and practice and they have the weapon and the scope and the capability to do that. But a lot of people, especially that come into our office that I deal with on a daily basis, don't have that. So I think that's something really good to talk to your partner about or whoever you're hunting with. I mean, my dad and my brothers and my husband, sometimes they tease me because I know what my range is and I'm not going to shoot further than I'm comfortable with. And so I'll sneak up on an animal and if it gets away, it gets away. That's my choice, but I feel much better in the end that I didn't take a poor shot or too long of a shot just because I felt that pressure from whoever I was hunting with. Yeah, definitely. And again, this comes up in so many different scenarios. Do you take a running shot? Do you shoot into a herd? You know, these things aren't illegal, but probably not the best choices to make if you don't want to wound animals, having them get away, um, and not having a quick, clean kill. So again, just talk about it. Be real about it ahead of time so that you know what you're getting into. It's better to find out ahead of time that you don't share ethics with someone than when you're out in the field with your scope on something and you're having a pretty substantial disagreement. So, um, Sarah, did you want to add anything? I know you just became a hunter ed instructor not too long ago. Yeah, so I think that's kind of the biggest thing is like knowing your own boundaries, establishing them with yourself and making sure that you're just open about them. Cause that's going to be some of the biggest things, especially if you're hunting with someone new and just wanting to make sure like, this is what I'm comfortable with and make sure that they're okay with that. Because in the moment, if they're pressuring you, it's just not going to be a good experience. And that makes it really hard. Yeah. Yeah. That's the, the other hard thing is that when you get into the field, there's really no way for us to prepare you for buck fever. And it does happen. It's real. Um, even, I mean, doe fever, you know, you see an animal, especially if it's your first time or even your first few times, I still get, you know, pretty hyped up when I'm out hunting and I see an animal and you're getting ready. Um, sometimes all reason seems to leave you in those situations. And so again, if you have somebody with you that you've both talked about, what you will and will not do, um, that you can stick with that, hold each other accountable and don't let buck fever get the best of you because it's definitely a real thing. <laughs> um, someone who will go at your pace. I have heard many stories of women and men who will not go hunting anymore because someone dragged them up and down a mountain that they were not prepared to be up and down, um, made things really uncomfortable they might've gotten injured, blisters. I mean, just a really bad experience. And so if you don't wanna hike up and down a mountain, that's fine. Um, don't go with somebody that's gonna say just a little further, just a little further, oh, you baby, just go a little further. Because some people that that's just the way they hunt. And so knowing how you wanna hunt um, will help you find hunting partners that will also uh, go at this pace and not be pushing you and pushing you to do something that you're not comfortable doing um, and something that you're not physically prepared to do. So I think that's a really important one. Um, I've been in that situation a few times myself and have obviously never hunted with that, that person again, but you know, there's really no reason for it. So um, just don't let anybody uh, take you out of your comfort zone as far as pushing you into situations that you're not 
comfortable, feel safe, um, or physically able to do. Yeah. Okay. And if you get one in one of those situations, um, you need to let whoever you're hunting with know. I mean, if you get hurt or if you're hungry or tired or just can't go any further, you, you do need to communicate with them too. I mean, for those of you who might not know, I take my two kids with me and my husband when we go hunting and one of them's four and the other one's a year and a half. And I mean, I ask them probably a million times like, okay, are you cold? No. Okay. Are you hungry? And I've tried to instill it in them already. Like if you need something, you need to tell me, cause I don't want them to get to the point where they're too cold or hungry or tired that it's miserable for everyone. Yep. You'll never want to go again. If you get, in, get yourself into some of those situations, especially your first couple times out, you'll just be like, this is not worth it. So it doesn't have to be that way for sure. Okay. So I love this picture because obviously you can tell she's cold. <laughs> um, that, you know, Montana hunting season, sometimes in October when it starts, we've got some nice weather. Um, sometimes in November when it ends, we've got some nice weather, but it can be a very cold sport. So um, just again, we want to get real with everybody. And so you're not out there expecting something that's not realistic. So I always hated my dad for saying this. <laughs> it's called hunting, not harvesting. After I drug myself all over the place and we didn't see a thing. Um, but again, it was something I had to learn as a kid growing up in a hunting family that sometimes it was just about going out and trying and we didn't see an animal, we didn't harvest an animal and that was okay. But at the end of a long day with maybe a blister on my heel, I did not like hearing that. <laughs> so, but it's true. Um, you might go out a lot and not see anything or be able to harvest anything. So just know, um, you know, if you do get lucky, especially your first year or your, you know, for second year and you get something on the first day, like that's great, but just know that it's not always super easy. Um, it's not always, again, kind of what the TV shows are, are showing you, um, sitting, I know there's a lot of people that like to move, but sitting is usually something that you have to do so that you're placing yourself where animals are coming through. Um, you're trying to get there before them or um, setting yourself up for them to come back through someplace. So you might be sitting and it might be cold and you might get really bored. Um, so, you know, think about that. Think about things that maybe you can do. I know one of, uh, one of the instructors that kind of helped with the gear, she takes the book with her. So if she knows she's going to be sitting somewhere for two hours before anything is even going to be moving, she can sit there and read until she really has to start paying attention, you know, um, the time of day the animals are moving through. So that's, that's an option that you will be sitting, um, hiking someplace, sitting down and being there for a while. Um, hiking, a lot of people will continually move. That's just another way of hunting. And so um, depending on where you're hunting, you might have some flat, you know, if you're around Great Falls or in Eastern Montana, but you're still gonna do a lot of walking, you're going to do some hiking. Um, you're probably going to be, you're either going to be sitting for hours or you're going to be hiking, hiking, moving, moving around. So probably a combination of both, but just know it's a, it's probably going to be fairly physical. It's probably going to be cold. Um, it's a very weird experience being outside right before the sun comes up and feeling the temperature drop. Um, it's just, it's this weird phenomenon that, that it gets colder at least I feel like it does before the sun comes up. And so it can be pretty, pretty chilling. Um, so we've talked about gear and again, it comes, becomes really important to be dressed appropriately when you get out there, because if you're cold and you're sitting, you're probably going to be miserable. Spooking game. Even if you're sitting, you could spook the game. You could see, you could hear them coming or they might catch your scent. Um, so there you are sitting for a few hours, just waiting, and then they catch your scent and you hear them taking off or you jump something when you're hiking around and it takes off. Um, so even your best intentions, um, be prepared to spook the game and see nothing but a white tail. If you're hunting white tail, um, going like this, waving at you as it runs away or those mule deer bouncing away from you. Um, so that happens. Um, and elk too. I mean, they're very wary creatures usually. So that happens. Um, the wrong game, you might sit someplace for hours 
and then have something walk in front of you that you can't shoot in that area or you don't have a permit for. Um, so just, again, be really careful when you uh, decide where you're going to hunt and what you're going to hunt, knowing if you can shoot a spike bull elk or if you can shoot a doe and not letting, again, that buck fever take over and you accidentally shoot something you're not supposed to because you've been so excited and waiting so long, the first thing in, that comes in front of you, you shoot. So uh, not every animal that walks in front of you is going to be something you can harvest. And this is probably the hardest, um, the hardest one is if you have a bad shot on an animal. And it's something that I think people should just just talk about and be real about because it happens to people and it's, it's not a good situation, of course. And um, it's just something that you need to be aware of. And so like Laura said, she has a set um, range that she will shoot. I have the same thing. I will not take running shots. I want to have a rest. So I have a lot of kind of fail safes built into my hunting experience, but that doesn't always mean I'm going to have a perfect shot. And so Wounding an animal is a super bad feeling. Losing an animal, not being able to find the trail and find that animal is a horrible feeling. And so just know that, you know, don't let it scare you off, but let it motivate you to be more prepared before you go out, practice shooting, um, things like that, so that you put as many cards in your favor as possible so that you hopefully don't have to worry about these, these situations very often. Um, Lori or Jesse, do you guys have anything you want to add to that? It's, it's one of the hardest parts of hunting, I think, is um, having to deal with a wounded animal. And, and even if you have everything perfect, like, I mean, after hunting for so many years, it's probably bound to happen as you probably are going to have a bad shot, you know, and I think like Sarah said, you, you just really need to learn, learn from it and learn how you can make yourself better. I lost a deer. It was probably, gosh, 15 to 18 years ago. And I, I know I had a perfect shot and I shot this deer and I know I hit it good and I could not find it. I mean, I looked for hours and hours in this coulee. I mean, my dad and my brothers were with me at the time. They looked and I could not find her. And still to this day, I still feel bad about it. But it's something that I've just had to get over and I've just had to learn, you know, like Sarah said, I have a lot of other things too. Like I don't take running shots. I have a bipod on my gun. So I either have to be sitting or laying down. Like that's just my rule, you know? So I have all these things that I try to do now too. And it, I, so I did learn from the situation and it has made me a better hunter. That's just part of the game. Mm -hmm. yeah, and I've had the same thing as Laura, you know, I have just like those guys said, I've got my fail saves come in and took a shot. Seemed like an, a great shot, sounded good. The animal looked like it was hit well looked for hours, never found it, you know, and it's, and it's, yeah, several years ago. And I'm always like, oh man, I just, I hate it. But you learn from it. You, you, you make adjustments. You, sometimes there's nothing you can do and it's just the breaks and it's, it feels terrible, but you know, is it, if you learn from it, if there is something you can do, and if you can't, you just understand that sometimes crappy things happen and you move on. Um, and you just have to be okay with it sometimes. <laughs> the other thing I was gonna say what to expect with sitting and hiking <laughs> more times than not, be, be aware of your surroundings. We've said that a thousand times. I can't tell you how many times I've sat down or crawled across a stinking prickly pear patch <laughs> and you're picking those darn spikes out of your leg for weeks. It's really unpleasant. So be, be, <laughs> Be aware, bring tweezers if you need to, uh, but pay attention, <laughs> know where you're going, know what to expect. Yep, definitely. I've met a, just, just a handful of people in my, my time hunting and teaching that a bad shot was enough to keep them from hunting moving forward. And you know what, if that's where you end up, that's okay too. So you don't have to feel like, um, you know, it, sh it shouldn't end it for you if you don't feel like, you know, if you feel like you can move on and, and become better from it.
But if that's, you know, something that keeps you from hunting in the future, that's okay too. Um, I have met people that have made that decision and that's totally a personal one. Uh, again, it's just something that you'll have to deal with if, and when it happens and you can deal with it. So don't let it completely, hopefully completely ruin things for you. Yeah. I'll just kind of add in there really quick. Yeah, um, please do. Ex especially for, there's been bad shots as long as hunting's been around since before we were even born. And those emotions and that remorse that you feel is part of what makes you a good hunter and it helps you stay ethical and want to make those good shots. So if you're not feeling that I'd be more concerned than when you do have a bad shot and that does happen. That's such a good point. Yes. Thank you. And if you need to help someone else get through it, you know, um, be prepared for your hunting partner to have a bad shot and you needing to help them try to track or trail an animal. And I mean, I've known people that have literally looked for weeks after the fact, um, sometimes they've actually found the animal at that point, you know, it doesn't do a lot of good, but they just wanted to know. So, um, okay. A few other things. It'll probably get emotional. We kind of talked about that, but uh, a bad shot is not the only probably time that it'll get emotional. Let's say you hiked up somewhere and you tripped and you get debris down your barrel. So if you don't have a gun cleaning kit with you, um, or even if you do, I mean, don't put a stick down your barrel, but you're kind of done at that point. If you get debris down your barrel, um, you don't want to be taking shots out of that. So that's a pretty, pretty frustrating thing that could uh, launch you into, <laughs> into a little bit of emotion. Um, you hike out somewhere and you forgot your licenses in the truck. You have to have your licenses on you. So make sure you double check because if you get all the way out there and there's a bull elk sitting in front of you and you don't have your licenses, you're walking back to the truck empty handed. Um, again, your hunting partner pushes too hard. You're tired, you're hungry, you might have a blister, you're wet, you're cold, and they just keep pushing. You're probably going to have a little bit of a meltdown, um, understandably. Hunting with kids, um, that could get emotional on either side. Again, Laura takes a lot of time and effort um, making sure her kids are comfortable, knowing when to stop, um, things like that. And it's just really important to remember that if you're hunting with kids, you're, you're forming how they're going to feel about hunting for the rest of their lives. Um, again, losing an animal is very emotional. Um, harvesting an animal is super emotional, right? So um, we're going to talk about that a little bit more in the next session, but it can be a pretty emotional experience for, for people, especially your first animal um, can be pretty emotional. And uh, it's just important to know that that's okay. You're not the only one that feels that way. Um, and then this one, I always, I always tend to forget every year. Like I've come off this adrenaline high after I harvest an animal. And then I'm like, oh, now the real work begins. I have to field dress this animal. I have to get it out of the field. And you, you, you're probably a little tired and coming off this adrenaline high. And so it's okay um, and totally normal for all of these things to maybe put you into a state that uh, you're not normally in. So again, just being super realistic about it, you might get emotional about one or all, or who knows what. You might almost step on a rattlesnake. I've done that before. Snakes are a phobia. And I've been like, nope, we're going back to the truck. I'm done. So um, things like that happen. And don't, uh, don't you beat yourself up over stuff like that is, I guess, the point I want to make. Yeah. <laughs> I'm sure... Um you guys have had some of these situations? <laughs> yeah, so so the adrenaline high is a real thing. So I'm not very good at sneaking up on antelope because they're always in a huge group in the middle of a field. And this year I was super proud of myself because it was me and my husband and my two kids. And I snuck probably almost a mile in this field by myself, like crawling. And just like Jesse said, I had like cactus in my legs. And then I got in this patch of mud and I ended up shooting this doe antelope and I was so proud of myself and my adrenaline was just out of control that when I was walking back to the vehicle to get my husband and my two kids, I threw up and I got back to the truck and my husband's like, what's wrong with you? I'm like, I just can't believe what I did. I'm sick. And he's like, are you okay? And I'm like, I don't know. I mean, it's a real thing, but it's pretty cool when it happens too, because it's it's just proud. You're proud and you're happy and everything all at once. 
Yeah, and physically, you've been through some stuff. So um, yeah, that's a great one, Laura. Thank you for sharing. And I think the same can be said. I mean, even if you don't, even if you come close to getting something, you're like, oh my gosh, I might get a shot. You get so amped sometimes. It's so easy to do. It's just, it's exciting. There's so much happening, even if it's in slow motion. Uh, you just get really excited. Even if it's the wrong species, sometimes you're like, oh my gosh, do you know what I just saw? And you can get, you can get so, I can get so emotional over so many things. Like, I'll get emotional over, oh my God, was that the most beautiful sunset in the world? I mean, just all the things. So it's, this is a minimal list. There are a million other things to get good emotional and bad emotional over. <laughs> yeah. You're human. Just remember that. There's no reason because you're hunting, all of a sudden you're not a human. So I don't know why there's that kind of perception of that, you know, you need to be the tough hunter. It's like, uh, we're all humans and that's okay. So just remember that. <laughs> okay, so these are just a few things we'll quickly go through because I know we're getting to the end of our time. Um, but I'm a huge believer in prepping ahead of time. Again, you can do so many things now to make for a more positive hunting experience. Um, we kind of talked about this before, but break in your boots. You go buy a new pair of hunting boots, break them in before you go hunting break in your backpack, break in your body well before hunting season. You can start now if you haven't already. Um, hike, hike, baby. I thought that was fun. Um, you know, if you know you're going to be doing a lot of hiking, if that's the kind of hunting you're going to be doing, start hiking, start getting your body used to it. Take your pack with you. Don't take your pack with 50 pounds in it the first day out, but just take your pack the first time or the first week or um, thing. Yeah. And then slowly add weight as you start to get stronger and stronger, knowing um, how much you're going to want to take with you and that you might have to pack an animal out. And we'll talk more about that in the next series. You know, if you're hunting in some of the remote places in the state, you might not be able to have someone help you drag it back to the car to take home and process. You might be boning it out um, or and taking it out on a backpack. So just be, be prepared um, in all these ways. And it's just going to help you have a much better experience. Shooting, practice shooting. Um, I can't stress this one enough. If you need help finding a shooting area or a shooting range where you live, please let me know. Um, part of my job is we do shooting range grants, so I have a pretty good handle on where you can shoot in the state, um, as well as some public access. But don't just sit at 100 yards with a rest, you know, unless that's all you're all you're going to do. Um, try to change, you know, change positions, lay down on your knees, you know, different shooting positions, different angles. If you're going to be in a tree stand, you know, you want to practice in realistic ways so that you know you get out in the field. And all of a sudden you have to lay down in the grass and all you've ever done is shot up on a bench. Um, you're going to find yourself in a whole different situation. Um, scout if you can. We've given you some tools that you can use. You really should try to scout ahead of time. And again, we've talked about this, but just have the conversation with your hunting partner about you, what you will and you will not do. Um, you know, I won't eat a tuna sandwich out on the trail, but I will have peanut butter and jelly. Something as simple as that could really save your, save your hunting trip, especially if you're hunting with a spouse. I think it can get, um, it can get difficult sometimes depending on if you have different hunting preferences or, you know, you're the new newcomer to hunting and, and your partner thinks that they know everything, um, even though it doesn't always apply to you and the way that you want to hunt. So, Again, having these conversations ahead of time will just really hopefully help you have a smoother experience out in the field. So, yeah. And then we're just going to rock and roll through safety really quick here, and then you guys can ask questions and we can add anything to. Um, but staying, staying safe, obviously, is a huge, a huge one. Montana is a pretty brutal state. Um, you can get yourself into situations pretty quickly that you might never imagine. Um, I like to tell people with any kind of recreation Montana, don't go alone. Um, Jesse, you could probably talk about this. I think you hunt alone, which is, is an option. But if you're new, if you're just starting out, I'd really recommend you don't go by yourself. Um, having a first aid kit is always a good thing. Knowing how to use it, take a class if you can find one um, in your area. Uh, it can make a big difference to have some muscle memory before you get out in the field and have to treat an injury. 
we've said it before and we'll say it again and again, carry bear spray. Um, we'll talk a little bit more about bear spray and bear encounters when we talk about meat in the next session, um, but please carry bear spray, have it where you can access it. And again, be aware of your surroundings. Sometimes when you're coming off that adrenaline high or you're on that adrenaline high, you might not be paying attention to what's around you, but bears are a very real thing in Montana, um, even you know moving further out east now. And so just make sure you have your bear spray. Um, stop and orient yourself from time to time. You know, if you have maps on your phone, that's great. If you have a paper map, that's great. Um, sometimes like if you were in this kind of landscape, it might be difficult if you get yourself turned around or you're in a coulee or something. Um, I'd probably use the river knowing that I could always spot the river, but just orient yourself from time to time so that you don't all of a sudden look around you and think, where am I? Why am I in all these trees? And all I can see is trees for miles. And I don't know which way is back to the road. Um, things like that, it just kind of helps as you go. Um, if you have a GPS, learn how to use it, um, marking your waypoints as you go so you can follow them back, things like that. And again, leave a hunt plan. So if something does happen, people know where to start looking for you. Um, if search and rescue goes in one direction where they think you were and you decided to go off in another direction, it could cost them really valuable time trying to find you, especially if it's cold um, or you're injured, things like that. So just super, super important to leave a hunt plan with somebody. Okay, questions. Ask us anything. Just to add to the safety stuff, guys, for yes. all the stuff we talked about today, be really sure that on hunting day, it's not your first time using it, whether it's the Onyx or, you know, your GPS, whatever it is, be sure you're practicing with that prior to the day. There's a lot of people I've met who try and go out the day of and they're like, oh, I've got this GPS. They have no idea how to use it. The batteries die or they forget to mark a spot and they're, they're lost. They're, they're done for. Um, not done for, but it's it just makes things a lot worse. Um, so be sure you're doing all these things. Keep yourself safe. Know, know how to use the tools you are planning to use on your hunting day. Oh, let's see, we've got some questions. Have you ever been lost? That's a good question. Let me think about that for a minute. I can go. I yeah, have go for been it. lost. Um, so I didn't start hunting until I was 18. And then at that point I started hunting with some friends of mine and I was the inexperienced one trusting him to know where we were. And we completely came up this ridge and we're like, I have no idea where the truck is. I have no idea what I'm doing. So we spent the rest of the day and luckily found the truck just after dark. And it was like, I'm never doing that again. Not, no. Nope. I'm lucky I found the truck before dark. I would have to say, I don't think I have ever been lost. I had the luxury of growing up in a family that we've always hunted in the same areas year after year. So I'm very familiar with the places we're going because I've been going there since I was a kid. And so thankfully, um, I know those areas so well at this point that I don't know if I could get myself lost. But um, if I was ever to go out into some of the other areas in the state, I would definitely be concerned about uh, knowing where I was going and having a way to find my way back. Um, I didn't get lost, but I was misplaced once. <laughs> um, it was during archery season and me and my dad were hunting and there was two different water holes and I had never, you know, I don't like going by myself either. I just feel safer with someone else. And I just insisted like, I can go to this water hole, the truck's right there, I mean, I'll be fine, you know, so I, we parked the truck and we had to probably, I had to hike like half a mile to where I was sitting. And so during archery season, you sit there till dark, you know, so I'd watch my watch like, okay, it's almost sunset. Okay, I'll sit here 10 more minutes. Well, then I turn around to go to the truck and I thought I walked to where the truck should be and it wasn't there. And I was like in full panic mode. And I mean, you could probably see the lights from camp where I was at. Like I wasn't really that lost, but it like just like took my breath away. And then I walked probably literally like 20 more yards over this little hill and there was the truck. And I was just like, oh my gosh, that was so scary. 
But what it really taught me was when I'm walking into a place, a lot of times before that, I didn't really look behind me to see what the surroundings would look like if I was coming back out that direction. I was comfortable going in, but not out. So that's one thing that I learned from that. Yeah, that brings up a good point too, is things look different in the dark. So if you're hiking in somewhere in the, in the early, early morning, um, obviously you can't see. So scouting ahead and something in a situation like that is extremely important. Jesse, have you ever been lost? You know, I haven't. I, I've similar to you, I've had the luxury of growing up with a family who hunted in very much the same spots when I grew up and moved away. Um, you know, I still go back and if I hunt with my dad, I, I don't always know the area well, but I trust him enough and I know that he's hunted it for 40 years and he knows every nook cranny, you know, tree. He can he can be like, okay, 10 paces up here, you're gonna see this. And every time he's right. So I trust him. Uh, when I go out by myself, I only go to places that I know very, very well. And I don't go off into different directions that I haven't explored before on my own. Um, I, I, I am very careful about where I will go on my own. And it's always, you know, leave the hunt plan. Tell my husband when I'm going to be home. If I'm not home, this is where I'm going to be. You know this spot. So, but, so no, I've, I've been lucky enough never to have been lost, but a lot of that's because I've been with amazing people who didn't let me get lost. <laughs> All right. Any other questions or anything um, you ladies would like to add? No, I don't have anything to add. Okay. Well, then um, if, I'll give it another minute if anyone thinks of questions, but otherwise, of course, feel free to reach out to me. Oh, we've got one. We've, oh, you're welcome, Crystal. Um, again, our last session will be next month, and it will be about um, what happens after you harvest an animal, uh, field dressing, packing out meat, transporting meat, doing it the right way, CWD, because it's definitely something we should talk about. Um, processing meat and just some ideas from us on you know how we how we use our meat um, that's again it's a pretty personal thing but you know should you invest in a grinder you know things like that um, should you take it somewhere and have it done um, everything's gotten a little more complicated with CWD on the landscape but we will definitely talk about that and um, just yeah have a have a conversation about it so again, this will be, uh, it is recorded. I'm going to stop um, right now, but I will.